Welcome to the Empower Me Show with Pam Bright. This show is all about honoring you as a spiritual being, having a human experience. You are here for a reason, and it's no mistake that you are here on earth right now. Spirit has guided you to this very moment in time, so you could hear the messages Pam is about to share with you. She is a multidimensional healer, light language channel, transformation coach, wife and mother committed to helping you discover the tools and practices to empower you to live the best life you can. You get to choose the spirit path you take. You can connect to the spiritual guidance already all around you. Get ready to live a fully empowered life. This is the Empower Me Show. Welcome to the Empower Me Show with Pam Bright. And this is my sweet David Buck, who is my co-host, and we are joined today by our dear friend, John Jorza, who's going to speak to us about his challenges and his way of life that he has uh, taken on as a being of inspiration and power in the world today in a very great way. And uh, today is a special day because it's Memorial Day. So we want to do a quick uh, shout out to all uh, those men and women who have served uh, and helped protect our freedom and just take a moment um, and our grounding for the day to center where we are is just a quick moment of silence to focus on, uh, you know, a brother, a father, a sister, a mother, an uncle, anyone that you know of, um, even a friend um, who has served. Um, and they don't have to have passed, certainly, uh, to honor the ongoing efforts to protect our freedoms. So we'll just take a quick moment of silence here to honor that person in your mind. And today we do have someone with us who has served. Um, and we're going to be talking about breaking up the uh, vicious cycles, the vicious circles of violence that continue and perpetuate for one reason or another within ourselves, uh, within our communities, and within our world. And asking the question really, can they be stopped? Can we stop and end those cycles of violence and find another way through them? Uh, yes. So... We would like to hear, John, about your dad. I know that you have had um, some interesting times with dad as well as his, you're, you're actually covering his life um, and your life with him growing up. So why don't you tell us about your experience with your father? Well, um, it, it's, I, th I think of it in terms of being a classic uh, 50s and 60s um, upbringing in middle-class America, uh, grew up in Ohio in an industrial town uh, where uh, uh, my parents came from a, a Eastern European bloc country um, and made it uh, going for the American dream and were uh, less than skilled at, uh, I, I can't say that, not less than skilled, but didn't have a lot of knowledge about how to raise uh, a, a young man in this uh, world, that the environmental factors were that, that there was a, a, a kind of a uh, environment of, of uh, uh, punishment, uh, corporal punishment, and, and uh, in the city there was this um, background, not, not very apparent, but the uh, background of ma the mafia was there and people were getting killed and uh, a la the Sopranos, perhaps not that quite that bad, but there was corruption and, and people knew about the mafia. I had friends that uh, families and family members that were part of that. Um, I always remember going to a 
a, a basement dance party as a teenager and a young woman showing us a wet spot in the cement. It wasn't a, it was small. It was some money buried there, the $50,000 evidently, and that her father would kill us if, if we tried to get at it. And we all laughed and went back to dancing, but that was an example of how violence was a part of the culture, if you would, obviously not a war-like situation, but, uh, uh, and then TV and, and uh, this was before, so graphic of a depiction of, of uh, 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 violence was ubiquitous nowadays, but the, even then it was the, the, the cop shows and the Western shooting and all of that was, was commonplace. My dad was, was a World War II veteran. As a young man, he was a boxer um, and um, uh, went through World War II, was part of the D-Day invasion and, and uh, was uh, uh, exposed to, to um, uh, war, to say the least, and violence, and then came back and used corporal punishment with me. And uh, that affected me. That is the cause of what I later did was uh, 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 battered uh, my two former wives and um, had violence around me. And I went to Vietnam and that was an influence in um, uh, several other aspects of my life where I got a mindset that it was okay to hurt others who I felt were hurting me, whether or not that hurt was emotional or um, uh, uh, never physical. Uh, uh, rarely did I ever get physically threatened, but emotionally threatened, spiritually, if you will, but uh, mostly uh, uh, insulted, uh, that sort of thing I felt. And uh, my first fight or flight uh, coming from my limbic brain, if you will, uh, uh, was to fight. I ran away at times, but uh, I fought and that fighting was in the form of aggressively trying to stop or threaten or abuse or, or be physically uh, restraining, uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid, um, uh, some women in my life. So I, I've been, um, the term perpetrator has been used, batterer, abuser, um, I've been that uh, in my, uh, many years ago and, and I've worked very diligently to um, stop it. And as you say, cycle of violence, uh, 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 stop it within myself and others uh, over the last, uh, let's say 20 years, uh, at least. <laughs> it's interesting that uh, part of the purpose of our show is to provide education uh, for people who haven't been through certain things so that they can have more compassion for those who've gone through. So an interesting journey of words can exist when we go from excuses to influences. It sounds like you were influenced heavily, not just by the things that happened to you, but were happening around you. And that there's uh, like almost an acceptance that a culture of violence and ways of thinking about violence were acceptable when you were growing up. Yeah, I, I put it into terms of unexamined unconscious, if you will, um, mm. uh, and, and adaptations that I made. For example, if I was punished particularly uh, harshly, I would uh, fantasize at night as a preteen and a teenager, perhaps, maybe earlier, but I don't remember, um, would fantasize about uh, hurting him back mm. in different various ways using objects and vehicles of larger and larger sizes, I remember. But it. Uh, but what I'm pointing to is that I uh, habituated the idea of revenge. Mm. Now that, that was my particular um, uh, way of ingraining, if you will, night after night or many nights or more than a few nights of, of going to sleep with this idea is uh, I hurt, I've got to hurt him. Uh, uh, no compassion for him, no seeing his stresses and no seeing, and not to give him any excuses. Mm -hmm. He was unprepared for uh, an independently um, sensitive young man to be in his life. 
and his uh, lineage and background in the old country, um, corporal punishment was very common. And my understanding, it goes back generations, if not in antiquity. So we've got this unexamined part of us that I didn't start to examine till, um, well, actually into my 30s, 40s, um, uh, when my behavior became unacceptable to myself and yeah. obviously to others. And I started to look at what, what, what's the source of what, what, how does this happen that I'm, I don't want to be uh, threatening or abusive and I am. So that dichotomy and uh, found um, me uh, um, really finding out, researching, if you will, uh, bring, bringing the, what I don't know, I don't know up mm -hmm. to the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, and that's what I call my work. And that, that by having it at least consciously, I can work at changing it. Yeah, absolutely. So there was absolutely. a time that I, 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 well, quite frankly, in my 20s and 30s that I didn't know I had a problem. I thought yeah. this is just the way it was. Yeah. And I'm supposed to or allowed to uh, many different ways of uh, minimizing it, uh, my behavior um, until it wasn't. Right. So yeah. we are going to go to a break in just a moment. And uh, just to put a finer point on what we're talking about today, it's shining a light on one person's journey through a cycle of violence that has been uh, repeated throughout uh, his life and his journey uh, out of that as much as possible. And there's a song that comes to mind uh, from Billy Joel, and it's not an excuse at all, but it, the song is, we didn't start the fire. Um, <laughs> however, as we go forward with our own evolution, we can start putting out these fires. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So let's go to break. We'll be back um, to talk more with John Dorza and his amazing journey and his recovery into mm -hmm. the man he is today. Yeah. Welcome back to the Empower Me Show with Pam Bright. I'm David Buck, and we're joined by our dear friend, uh, John Jorza. I didn't say it at the top, but we've known John for decades. I've known him for four decades. So if there's a familiarity here that's coming across, this is one of the reasons why we've just uh, really empowered each other uh, through our lives together. And today we're talking about uh, John's life and what he's gone through uh, and uh, you know, gone beyond. And uh, just want to, for a quick review, there were many different sources of uh, just perpetuating this idea that a cycle of violence was acceptable in society uh, for John growing up. And uh, so now we're going to talk about uh, what happened for him in his uh, young adulthood. Yeah. So John, tell us about becoming a young adult. What was it like for you, your service, in um in was it the navy or the army the army the, the army. army and yeah. how how did that continue for you this what we call and term this cycle of violence in your life well, well let me say that that i had a happy childhood a normal childhood and generally uh, uh violence wasn't a uh, uh, predominant I certainly had a middle class upbringing and schooling and looking back and looking at incidents and, and um, um, uh, 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 that were an exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. And that uh, going into uh, college, I went to college for two years and was uh, very unhappy there, felt out of place, out of, out of touch uh, and thought that uh, uh, the military would be a, a great way of uh, getting to know myself. Uh, that was one of my uh, many mistakes in my life, but uh, an error, I, I should say. And then, uh, but I went into service, um, uh, volunteered my draft. In other words, I was drafted early, got thrown into the, to the army's um, machinery of training you to kill um, within days of you uh, all under uh, days of being inducted and starting basic training, uh, obviously disciplined and conformity and everybody um, 
uh, there was various, they've done movies about uh, basic training. Everybody knows about the, the stresses and the strainers and the, and the challenges that they are. But it basically tells you and, and gets you into the mode of young men, a gang-like mode almost of there's an enemy. It happened to be a North Vietnamese at that time. Uh, communist China, Chinese and North Vietnamese. There's an enemy threatening our freedom. We're uh, training you to to um, uh, kill them in no uncertain terms. And this is how you do it. And you learn to shoot a rifle, hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, strategies, uh, uh, throwing grenades, all of which is done in a, a particular disciplined and focused manner, but more of a camaraderie bonding men or young men are bonded to friends there. And, uh, and then after eight weeks or so, or I don't know how long it was, seemed like forever. And, and uh, I was sent to a uh, jungle training camp in uh, Fort uh, Polk or no Fort uh, uh, Polk, Louisiana, and trained further in uh, military policemen. And, um, and then sent uh, immediately to uh, Vietnam. There, uh, I was lucky enough not to get uh, infantry uh, assignment and didn't do battle. I was a, a security guard. So I like to say um, I spent 20, uh, 12 hours a day waiting to be killed or kill somebody. Mm. So I guarded a perimeter of a large base and um, we've got we got attacked twice during that times one was a, a mortar attack or rocket attack where five rockets landed in our uh, our company area and uh, close proximity enough to feel shrapnel guy and, and it was scary and i certainly uh was no hero and um uh terrified and it brought upon a particular uh, um, uh, i attribute that as well as the ongoing 24 seven, if you will, stress of being in a war zone uh, on, on a high alert, hyper vigilant to uh, exacerbate whatever PTSD I may have had. I came out of uh, Vietnam um, and I was introduced to drugs there and, and, and smoked a lot of marijuana to combat it, self-medicated instead of drinking, which most people did or reading or playing you know, uh, didn't have video games there playing pool or something, but it was a big base and we decompressed different ways. Um, I came out of the service, um, committed to peace and um, uh, being a hippie. So I uh, went back to Ohio and uh, still found it not my place to live. And I uh, traveled out to through the Southwest to LA and then eventually San Francisco to, to meeting my old uh, buddies from Vietnam uh, who felt like brothers, there's this camaraderie and um, settled down in the Bay Area. Got a job as a veteran, um, um, as, a, as a custodian in a, 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 a military industrial complex, Philco Ford actually in Palo Alto, but well-paying night job that I, um, uh, uh, did a lot of drugs around before and after and, uh, uh, and, and grew my hair out, my beard, had that lifestyle, lots of music, concerts, uh, uh, parties, etc. And for many years, uh, till 75, that was 1971, uh, I, got, I, got, I went to California and in 75, I did the S training uh, well, now landmark education and had a transformation in being and uh, uh, started to um, uh, address who I, who I was or, or who I really were, am. Uh, I'll let it, that go be the cliff notes of my youth <laughs> at that. Well, thank you very much for sharing all of that, John. It, uh, it, it takes some courage to uh, stand out there. I know it's not the first time at all for you to uh, describe the events of your life. And again, they're not like uh, excuses at all for behavior uh, and their, their influences. It's part of it. We want to shine light on each person's experience is unique and valid. 
And the more that we can hear stories about what has happened, the more it, it starts to make sense why people do different things. And, and really if, I may, if I may say quickly, uh, asking and getting answers to the question, why did it, why are you violent, John? My family asked me that, many psychiatrists and therapist asked me that. Uh, oh, actually, not, a, not too many because they knew the answers. It isn't a one reason. It isn't right. one place. It isn't one experience. It's a series and complex. Yeah. No PTSD is simple. Right. And that I bring these, hi I highlight these as, so people can have a basis on, well, that affected him that way. Yeah. And there's many, 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 many more people that have the same or worse or more intense or, or damaging or traumatic experiences that don't come to become to violence. Mm -hmm. I think my particular circumstances had something to do with it. And far and above anything else is that I chose, I let those influences have an impact on me. I didn't question them. Yeah. And that's the change that's, that's, uh, I hope to talk about uh, after the break is that I, that I, that I started, I stopped asking why and I started asking what will it take? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's yeah. a, that's, that's the turning point. I was just going to ask you, what would you say is the turning point when your transformation, your breakthrough actually happened? And we're going to hear more about that when we come back yeah. from break. And it just, uh, as a one last uh, bit here, there are so many ways to stop the cycles of violence within ourselves and within our communities and for our world too. And we're going to hear more about that when we come back from break, because John, has uh, done a lot of work on that, not just for himself. Yes, so we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Empower Me Show with Pam Bright. My name is David Buck, and we're joined by our dear friend, John Jorza today. We're talking about, is it possible to stop the cycles of violence within ourselves and within our communities and our world? And um, so one of the things that John has done a lot of work on is something that he calls finding another way. And in, in the beginning or, or in the ending, I should say, of stopping the cycles of violence, there's really only one thing that you need to do is find another way. That's right. So what would you say um, are the most important aspects of finding another way for you, John? Well, um, uh, thanks for asking. Um, this is, uh, I, I can say something about this out of trial and error that I've tried a lot of things that don't work. And uh, the ones that do, I keep refining and, and uh, trying to habituate in myself. And I, I, I could say fundamentally, there's a, a, a process that I went through. It may be out of order for other people or different orders for other people. And that um, uh, it started with uh, a recognition and it wasn't easy and it wasn't pleasant and, and it was, uh, an acceptance, if you will, my acceptance that I hurt another. Mm -hmm. And it, it's subtle, but it was pivotal uh, of, I would um, uh, threaten or shake or um, uh, throw things or hit a cabinet or be a, a classic domestic violence um, um, power and control, try to overpower and control someone else and minimize that in my mind, given what I've been talking about, about violence being just normal, if you will, or in part of the fabric and a, an acceptable way of, of dealing with my own feelings and my own stress, etc. So I would, uh, I finally, and it took uh, uh, into my uh, 40s, uh, I've been doing it very rarely, less than once a year or something like that, but it was enough that I was um, uh, arrested and, um, and uh, turned myself in. And uh, that was the pivotal point where I was confronted with the damage I did. Mm -hmm. And even then I tried to minimize it and go away and mentally 
uh, try to stop it. But uh, it was the turning point. Oh my good, what did I do here? Mm -hmm. Oh, she's um, uh, very hurt, not just physically, but but emotionally. And I've been doing, and the recognition that I've been doing it for years uh, of some kind of control, and that no wonder she doesn't love me anymore, mm -hmm. and eventually divorced me, my second wife. And this is the woman. I gave myself to and the love of my life. So I'm not saying this is not unimportant. This mm -hmm. was uh, critical. And I, and that's when I started to look this way that, rather than her. And I was in a uh, domestic violence intervention program at a local uh, facility uh, services, Wellspring family services in Seattle here. And, uh, um, uh, was in a program, two-year program of changing people's beliefs, thinking, and, be and then behaviors about being violent, abusive. Um, and uh, even the first six months of that, I, I was uh, kind of arrogant. I know it all. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll just walk through this and get on the other side and go back to my, my marriage. And, and really, the way I was, this isn't going to affect me. And six mm. months in, she filed for divorce, and uh, I became despondent and uh, got help from the therapist there and some other places at the VA, uh, which has been very helpful for me therapeutically and uh, around PTSD particularly, and uh, decided, if he was, given the choice in the program to continue, or I wanted to quit and get out, and uh, that's one of my patterns. And um, they said, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And you, you and, and mm -hmm. to that point, I didn't, didn't think that I could. I, I didn't think I could make any changes. Mm -hmm. That it felt like I was hopelessly uh, uh, at the effect of these uh, emotions, these hormones, these thoughts that overran my rational thoughts of not doing anything like this. And, and, and it is part of the limbic brain fight or flight uh, system that takes over in the, when threatened, when, I, when a human being is threatened in my particular background led me to, to accepting that. And the turning point for me was um, I can uh, uh, beat this thing. I can um, uh, stop it in time. And I began to work in this uh, two year program more diligently in that direction of uh, what can I do to stop it? Where So I started uh, looking earlier and earlier in these incidents, they had us write out each incident that happened that we were controlling or abusive or, or potentially violent, aggressive, what have you. And I see these feelings and ideas and thoughts and beliefs that I had happening in some pattern, and I began working on the precursors of my behavior and clearing them up through various therapies, uh, various things that I listed in the resources um, that I used to uh, deal with, resolve um, issues that I, before that, had taken out on who I thought was the source of it, and wrongly so. So that was another thing is that I, I recognized that that the way I thought and the the voice, if you will, in my head that said, you got to hurt her or stop it, uh, had a particular pattern, a particular age and and um, uh, repetition, you know, it was habitual. They were the mm -hmm. same thing. So I the big thing for me was I could recognize the precursors and then the thoughts that are getting me closer to being violent and uh, take action then, either yeah. precursor, eat breakfast, um, uh, mm. uh, relax, do breathing, uh, reevaluate uh, make my considerations, sense, uh, relax my body, all kinds of things that would de-escalate rather than escalate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing all this information. I think couple of the most important things I take from it is there's no short answer. There's no quick way through. It's a lifestyle change. It's an ongoing effort to 
change the way the patterns that you keep repeating within yourself, yes. um, whatever those patterns are. And there's so many different influences. Um, just to take a quick moment, um, I have one that I'd like to, to have our audience hear about, RC. Um, but besides that, maybe there's one or two others that have been most impactful for helping you. RC is reevaluation counseling, uh, also called co-counseling. It's been around since the 50s, and it's peer-to-peer -peer counseling to people that are trained and, and well-versed into listening, which is critical, and then what's called discharging or emoting those feelings that um, are natural to human beings that uh, are ways of healing uh, um, distress, trauma, any kind of distress, whether it be verbal or emotional or spiritual, you're distressed and laughing, crying, uh, shaking, um, and nothing, tremors perhaps, uh, nothing violent or epileptic or anything, um, you know, laughing, crying, and there's a couple more ways of discharging. Uh, talking fast, um, mm. getting something out. It's mm. not storytelling. It's not excusing. It's not about, but emoting. Yeah. So in, in one person will be uh, emoting for a specific amount of time. At the end of it, it's stopped. A uh, uh, process of, of becoming normalized, if you will, out of that state and then switch the same amount of time. So there's an equal, the person um, uh, being a counselor and counselee, uh, and, and it's left at that and it's structured and it's giving yourself uh, time to discharge, to release the emotional um, uh, distress in your body, in your, in your soul, in your mind. And, and what happens is you have a clarity that's mm -hmm. not there anymore. It's gone. Mm -hmm. The person listening accepts it, doesn't say anything. You're not, you're, you're in fact encouraged to be more uh, emotive and more discharging and you're doing fine and it's based on that uh, no one's uh, 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 there's nothing wrong with you yeah there never was and there never will be nice so, so you, you're 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 supporting each other and letting go of those things that's rc or reevaluation counseling is a tool that i use today and it's a release valve so that's working on i don't get stressed out and uh, uh triggered near as much yeah. uh, and if i do get close to that i'll take it into a session rather than take it out on quote the threat which isn't really real that's great that's awesome yeah. that's awesome so that's that's really really helpful and i have found in my own life with my own recoveries in different ways that yeah. really going it, I, I think of it like a like a tool that can get right into the center mm. of the problem, right? And just go right going right into that place. Yeah. And then just feeling mm. what's there without without any kind of of judgment around it. Just yep. feeling it mm. intensely is huge in releasing that valve like you talk about. Yeah, if I, if you will. If you will, um, the research is in RC is that animals shake after being traumatized mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, crying as babies is because of discomfort, let's say, but the distress, whether they're hungry, they're like that. So it's human to do these things mm -hmm. and that if you encourage them and get into it, you can go back to the source material, the earliest trauma that these this present time uh person is quote triggering but it's not them doing it and clear up that so it so i found it to be um, uh, um in-depth therapy and uh useful on on many levels and that uh your point about uh, can i say about the lion's roar yes oh please yeah uh, just uh going through your point about going through that change of accepting that I've done harm doesn't mean that I blame or guilt or, or, or have shame about it. It means that I'm with it and I discharge the, the, all those feelings about it and not have them anymore because someone had accepted it and accepted me for doing it. 
And it's sort of like in, in Africa, the, 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 they train young warriors to run toward their lion's roar. Mm. Because a, a, an older lion's job is to roar, scare prey into the clutches of, happens to be female, but we won't, um, to, to the younger um, lions. And so when you hear lions roar, one uh, generally runs away. Finding another way is running towards the lion's roar, which you find out is you have one old lion that really isn't a danger. And uh, he's one there and you can go around and actually run through him is what I say, but uh, without endangering yourself and find out that he's not a threat at all. Yeah. That, that you just didn't, as a child, you didn't have the uh, expertise and the uh, facilities to discharge it and weren't allowed to. Part of my upbringing is big boys don't cry or boys don't cry. Mm. You can't discharge, stop crying, don't do that. So that's part of the picture too. So running toward the lion's roar is my um, tagline. I think uh, you go towards something through it and that's how you get past it. Got if you it. run away with that, like I did with drugs and, and, and other activities, yeah. you, you don't ever face it and you don't get on the other side of it. The other side is through it. Thank we're gonna you. we're gonna go to break in a moment. Pam's got a question for you, but obviously there's this is such a deep and rich conversation. And I think the important thing for our audience is that there are so many resources available to you to help you deal with uh, whatever's going on for you. And when we come back from the break, we're gonna uh, talk about that a little more, including the work that you've been doing. But uh, Pam's got a, a good question here yeah. for you. So before we go to break, I'm just going to ask you the question and think about that and then at, have you answer okay. when we come back. So what did you have to give up to cause yourself a breakthrough in this area? I want you to think about that and then we'll, we want the answer when we come back. Welcome back to the Empower Me show with David Buck and I'm, uh, <laughs> This is Pam Bright. <laughs> I'm David Buck. We're just a little, it, it was still in the middle of the pandemic. We just had our shot the other day. So we have a little brain fog going on, but we're joined here by our dear friend, John Jorza. And uh, he, we've been talking about how is it possible to break the cycles of violence that we have within ourselves, within our communities and within the world. And I think the message is it can happen and it will happen when more and more of us uh, do the kind of work that John has been doing literally for decades. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so John, you've been working on a book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that book project? Indeed. Um, um, officially in a writer's group and uh, the intent of which is to uh, accomplish it by the end of nine months, the end of the year, uh, have written a shitty um, uh, first draft. So I'm, I'm in the beginnings of a book writing uh, adventure and it's what we've been talking about, my early influences, my life, it's a memoir, but a, also a self-help kind of um, uh, perspective as well. And I wanna write it for the men, men mostly, but, and that are um, abusers and, uh, and uh, their victims. And, um, and for society at large, and, and that I see this applicable, that one, um, uh, as to your question about what I had to give up, uh, uh, I had to give up my uh, hopelessness and my mm. helplessness and that I can't, mm. that I uh, shifted, and I call that shift a transformation at that, let's say the bottom of my despair and my uh, hopelessness and saying, I did have a possibility of doing something. I just didn't know how to. Mm -hmm. And then it became obvious to me that I had to find out. Yeah. Find out what? Well, something other than what I habitually have been doing, thinking yeah. and believing. So I found out uh, having another way of uh, having the same input, the same triggers, the same uh, uh, verbiage, uh, uh, social dynamic, if you will, the same other people's behaviors 
that would elicit something that I get go, do I want that? Can I choose that? I can now. All right, I'm going to choose another way. And not a haphazard, but, you know, the rational, logical, okay, what can, what can I change uh, in me? It's interesting because that's nothing for them. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the big shift. Even even now in this moment, I'm realizing the parallel between the surrender that you're describing within yourself and the surrender as it pertains to war and conflict in a way. To to yeah. give up something, to give up a position. You know, there's something so Thank central you. to it. We could talk for an entire other show about the power of surrender, and I think we should at some um, point. Yes, yes, we need to. Yes, do we that. should. We <laughs> need to do that. Because here's the thing there's also a parallel between what we're talking about here with John's story and John's life, and what we've already been talking to about with habits, mm -hmm. creating new habits yeah. that are yeah. empowering for you as a listener. Um, looking at, okay, so I'm in this position of being stuck, feeling like there's no way out, mm -hmm. feeling like I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again, and knowing that it's really damaging. What, how can you find another way? Yes. That's exactly. our biggest message for you in this. Yeah. So it is possible to break this cycle. And how can what is possible when we break that cycle, David? Well, there's, uh, you know, it's possible to recover and to redeem and to reinvent yourself and reemerge as a new person, as a new being. There's so many ways to do that on our splash page for this episode. We're going to have a list of resources that John's put together and a few other things. There'll be a, a, a Pinterest board of some images that might help you kind of uh, navigate through this and some music to listen to as well. A big part of what we do here on the Empower Me Show and indeed Pam with her uh, business, Bright Butterfly Enterprises, is to help people find another way. And we've been so inspired, John, by uh, what you've done. Um, uh, immediately upon hearing it, uh, I saw the brilliance in uh, what you were doing to help yourself find another way through the maze and out the other side, but it can be applicable in so many situations as well. Yes, yes, yes. And John, I'm so incredibly honored to have you here today. Honored for who you are, honored for what you bring, honored that you are such a courageous soul to have taken this on as a life-changing stand in the world. Mm -hmm. You're a stand mm -hmm. for nonviolence in the world. Yeah. That's who you are. Thank you. And I am so incredibly honored and grateful that you are my in my family. You're in my family. And I absolutely I love and adore you. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have just a couple of minutes left in our show. But uh, John, we hope when you publish your book that we're the first stop on your world tour of uh, press. Because uh, <laughs> we'd love Dunk to share it. Dunk it, yes. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. We shall see. Um, if I may say, too, is that uh, one of the benefits, or I should say openings and possibility uh, that happened as I cleared up and worked on myself, I got my family back, that I got my mm -hmm. two former wives were blended now, uh, accept each other. Uh, they had the greatness, really the greatness to forgive me, not forget. They yeah. still get <laughs> handled, as you, if you will, but I'm not stimulated. My behavior changed, yeah. and they initiated uh, coming back together as a family yeah. because we were split up many years ago. So uh, the, one gets one's own self-power and, uh, and really power, not force, and, mm. uh, uh, and, and, and is more oneself by finding your way finding the way, but not someone else's. And that's what I want to leave you with is that my journey is one and yours, it, it's the direction that's important, not yeah. the path. 
Yes. Well, yes. I love the fact that you make a distinction between power and force. Yes. You don't have to force something to happen, and it can be powerful to surrender and exactly. go of a position or a habit. So yeah, I would I'm also motivated. like. Yeah, I would also like to um, echo what you just talked about with self responsibility. Mm -hmm. I have I have said for a very long time that when each individual on this planet takes 100% responsibility for their actions in the world, it will transform this entire world. Yeah. So that's my invitation to you as a listener. That's my invitation to you as a person who is willing to go through mm. the fires yeah. of your life. Yeah. Oh. That you will absolutely know what it feels like to be in bliss to be in reverence for life, to be in absolute honoring of yourself as an individual soul and be able to contribute your gifts to the planet. So John, I am so excited that you are writing a book. I can't wait to read it. Yeah. <laughs> and please let us know when you're near, near the time of publishing. I actually had a foresight that you might want to consider, which is to pre-sell your book. Like actually okay. pre-sell it. <laughs> because it Fine. will, it, it, yeah, 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 it's going to be published and it's going to be amazing. So yeah. the, the, the kind of work that Pam is talking about is work, uh, but it's worth doing because um, when we change what we're fighting against to what we're fighting for, then shifts can happen. So I uh, just want to say again that, that we have a splash page full of resources to help you out. And uh, we want to say thank you, John, for being here today. Thank you to our production team at Transformation Talk Radio for hosting our show. We couldn't do this here without you. Um, you can find us on uh, uh, the Empower Me show. Uh, you can just search for Google. Email us with any questions or comments. Or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, uh, let us know what you'd like to talk about. It's the empower me show at gmail.com. And uh, what's coming up next week? Oh, next week we get to be with the language of light. Once again, it'll be our second episode of the language of light. And I will be channeling light language for you, giving you blessings, giving you healings, um, anything that you need with that um, I'm available for. It is a call-in show. So the phone number will be on your screen. Um, you can also email me at the empower me show at gmail.com. Yes, yes. <laughs> had to think about that for a minute. Yeah. Um, and let me know what you need. If you also have a loved one that you would like um, healing for, let me oh, know yeah. that as well. Yeah, for you or someone else. So thank we, you very much. We are so excited that you're with us. And John, be blessed. Mm -hmm. And we will talk soon. Indeed, dear friends. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Empower Me Show with Pam Bright on Transformation Talk Radio. Tune in every Monday at 3 p.m. to learn more about living a fully empowered life. Remember that your life is up to you and you can choose the spiritual path you are on. There is spiritual energy and wisdom in everything and everyone around you. Listen carefully for what the universe is trying to tell you in every moment you are already being guided along your journey. Call upon your spirit guides anytime you need help with anything. Know that you are safe in every moment, even if it seems that you are not. For more information about Pam Bright, visit brightbutterflyenterprises.com or email theempowermeshow at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening. We hope to see you next week.